Welcome to FESPA Fabric. Uh, once again, this is our second presentation. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we start, I would just like to say thank you to FESPA, to Bowel, to the team, the events team. Um, you're doing a fantastic job and really, really thank you for uh, putting on this amazing universe of print. Um, Charlie has his chocolate factory, but we have our University of Print, so thank you, FESPA. Now, my name is Gavin, Gavin Drake, and I'm the owner of Garment Printing. We are a B2B um, garment printing company. We, we provide businesses of all sizes, from individuals all the way up to global brands with the uh, customization of their clothing, garment decoration. I'm joined with Simon, who's head of production. We're going to talk to you about direct-to-garment printing. Um, I'm going to give you some ins and some outs and some, some tips, tips of what we've learned over the last sort of 10 years of DTG printing. So, um, how will this presentation be useful for you? Well, we will give you the um, a top 10 essential questions that you must answer. Do you want to add some of those out, Simon? Um, giving you a, a, a checklist so that if you're thinking about getting into direct -to garment printing, you know what questions to ask. In addition, we will also provide you with a, um, a price versus speed grid, enabling you to compare most of the machines on, available on the market in one document. This will help you understand what your budget is and, and what machine you can consider buying. Um, this will in turn give you some time saving because it will help you understand which machines to communicate with. The essential thing to understand is that we only work with direct to garment printing machines, printing onto pre-made clothing, not roll to roll. And the machines that we talk about are those that we've had experience with in the last 12 months. There are others, it's not an exhaustive list. So quickly, my company was born in about 1995. We brought on DTG early in uh, 2004 with Brothers Machine. In 2005, we started printing direct -to garment to uh, colored clothing using white inks. Uh, we outgrew our expectations, so in 2010, started outsourcing. Uh, we launched in Spain in 2012. DTG has gone from being approximately 10% to 45% of our turnover in the last two years, so it's growing for us. Uh, it's opened up new markets. Um, we are launching in Germany uh, with garmentprinting.de. You can find us garmentprinting.co.uk, garmentprinting.es, and garmentprinting.de. And uh, next year we'll be hopefully expanding further across Europe into France, Italy, and other European countries. So we offer a full service customization to our clients, whether it's screen printing, uh, embroidery, vinyl, CAD cut transfer, all over um, dye sublimation, and of course, direct to garment printing. We take the client's artwork, we look at their budget, we analyze what they need, and then we deliver them their quotation and their objectives. The machines that we use in-house is the Brother GT3. We have three of those. We have an Epson, and we also have a Polyprint. And we outsource using the Avalanche, Cornet's rather expensive machinery, and also now on the new entrant into the market, the Aoun. So we've, we've got experience with DTG, uh, with the smallest machines, and all the way through to the biggest machines. Okay, I'm going to hand you over to Simon now, who's going to give you a little bit of information on the processes. Thank you, Gavin. Um, yeah, my name's Simon. I've been in the textile printing industry for about eight years now. I'm working closely with Gavin at Garment Printing for about two years. Um, do we have any DTG printers out here? Anyone actually doing DTG printing? Yeah? Well, um, we've classified printing onto white as, uh, as easy as ABC. Um, you don't need any white ink. There's no pre-treatment process and it really is uh, very simple and when done correctly, very profitable way of t-shirt printing. Um, so you create your design, put it onto the computer, into the software, uh, load the t-shirt onto the, into the DTG printer and then just hit print. Um, the design will be printed straight onto, the, uh, straight onto the white garment and then it's a matter of taking that out of the DTG machine and then and you dry it under a heat press or through a tunnel dryer. Um, very, very simple process and as I say, it can be very profitable. And then on the other side of the coin, we have printing onto dark garments, um, a much more complex procedure. Um, in this case, we are talking about white ink, using white ink and, uh, and pre-treatment. Um, it is a multi-step process. Uh, it can take approximately three times longer on average. Um, and the artwork preparation here, you do need a, a bit of a higher level of expertise. Um, there are people Obviously, the, the, the technicians and everything, they will help you with artwork preparation. Um, as well, once you've got your artwork prepared, uh, you then have to pre-treat the garment. Um, this is uh, using a pre-treatment liquid, 
That then has to be dried under a heat press or through a tunnel dryer. Uh, after that, that needs to go into the DTG machine where it will first of all print a layer of white and then the CMYK on top. Um, there are machines w which will do this in one pass, so the white and the color, or in a, and there's other machines that do the whole white layer first and the CMYK afterwards. And once this is done, you take it out of the DT machine and again through a tunnel dryer or a, um, or a heat press. So uh, roughly three times longer, three-step process, so pre-treatment, white ink, and the CMYK. Um, if done properly, again, can be profitable, but it is much more labor-intensive and, uh, and, and, and a lot longer. So that's the process for printing onto darks. And so just a quick recap, so what's needed when you're DTG printing? You obviously need your DTG machine. Um, you need a, a pre-treatment machine. This can be either a handgun, so you're manually pre-treating, or you can have a, a pre-treatment machine which m does much even layer, much more even layer of pre-treatment. And then there's other machines out there which have the pre-treatment and DTG machine in one, um, namely the Cornet. Uh, they're very big on this. Um, we've got a sample actually, just to show the importance of pre-treatment. Um, and obviously you need a, a, a dryer, either a tunnel dryer or a heat press to, uh, to dry both the pre-treatment and the, and the print afterwards. Um, just to highlight the importance of pre-treating, we did a few samples and we've got one, with my colleague Gavin has got one here. So one side is pre-treated and the other side isn't. And obviously, the side that isn't pre-treated, well, it doesn't print. The ink has been absorbed into the garment itself. So what the pre-treatment does is essentially allows the, or st stops the ink from penetrating into the garment. So it sits on top. It has a very different feel to when printing onto whites, which, has, which is very soft. And the ink's actually gone into the garment itself. Um, so yeah, pre-treatment is a bit of an art in itself and does need to be done correctly. Yeah, technically the pre-treatment, um, its objective is to stop the ink from absorbing into the fabric. But then the second and the, the, the actual function of it is to print a layer of white so that you can then put your colours on top of the white. With screen printing you do a flash screen. Um, so the future of direct -to garment printing, as you've seen at some of the stalls, Polyprint store for example, is, 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 is building a bridge between screen printing and direct -to garment printing. The objective being removing the pre-treatment process because of the complications that it brings. Uh, and it does bring complications with it. I mean, if you're first starting to think about getting into DTG, we recommend you go and start with printing just whites only. It's, it's, a, it's a safer bet. Okay. Completely. So. DTG, the life of direct garment printing. Uh, approximately the first machines for sale um, was about 2004. Um, so it's been around for near on 12 years now. Um, the early stages, it was the early adoption period and there were lots of problems with the machines. Primarily the problems was, was white ink printing. Um, the machines couldn't sustain the the, the, the power of the, of, of, the, of the white ink and there was lots of ink clogging, for example, and pre-treatment problems. Um, there was lots of research and development done. And then we saw around about 2010, as you can see, a settling down period. Um, one example of that was that Cornet brought out their Paradigm machine. And this is a machine that sits, it's a roll-in, roll-out, direct garment printing machine that sits in with your screen printing carousel. So it enabled the, the, the undercoat, to the, you know, the flash screen to be printed with a screen and then the CMYK digital printing to be placed on top. Um, since 2000, well, 2015, we, we've, lots of other smaller machines now are available on the market where they're, they're hybrid machines, again building this bridge between screen printing and direct -to garment printing. Um, another major factor that tells us that we are actually now into the green light area, as we've put it, we think that the machines have all settled down. There are new entrances into the machine. Muto have released uh, a DTG machine this year at FESPA, um, but, but a very good example. Something to understand, brother, brother machines use brother ink heads. Um, most of the other smaller machines that you see available use Epson print, print heads. Um, Epson only entered the direct garment printing realm about a year and a half ago with their new machine. So if Epson are now into it after 10 years of watching all of its uh, users to do DTG, that shows that, that direct, direct garment printing is now steady and definitely here to stay. Um, so it's now more about what we can do with direct garment printing, how we can develop new markets, 
um, rather than is the machinery sustainable. It definitely is sustainable. We've touched upon most of these problems here. One of the issues with direct-to-garment printing could be considered that you cannot Pantone match. So with specific brands, you may not want to use direct-to-garment printing because you will not get perfect colors. Although Corneat have launched their, their Hexa. Hexa, yeah. What is it, the Hexa Avalanche? Hexa Avalanche. The new machine, their newest machine, incorporating um, red and green additional ink colors. They claim maybe 95% color matching, but still, if you're printing onto um, a black T-shirt, and then you're printing onto a red T-shirt, and then a green T-shirt with the same design, you're going to have a different color logo. Now, brands don't like that. I'm going to give you just a couple of examples here. We've got two green, two green T-shirts. Um, they're different brands, so they're different fabric. One of them is a heavyweight cotton. The other one is a slightly more combed cotton. You'll see the difference in the blue if you look closely and, and the, the quality of the output. And um, if you're Coca-Cola, if you're Orange, if you're a brand, you're not going to be happy with that. And also fashion clients aren't happy with these, the, the, these, these outcomes. There is a variability that comes with direct to garment printing and you have to be careful of this. Um, Simon's now going to talk you through the machines that we have um, researched this year and giving you an indication on price and budget. Yep. So here we're going to have a quick look at uh, price speed comparison and what your budget could allow you to, which, uh, which entry level machine you might consider. Um, we'll just highlight here that these are prices that were given to us by manufacturers and distributors, but they do have deals out there and it's best to verify with them uh, their current pricings. Um, so we have classified a few machines in the, what would be the entry level entry-level machines. Um, the, the top one, the Polyprint, uh, the Textjet from Polyprint is an extremely good machine and they are a very good company. They've, um, they've helped us out a lot and they're just down the aisle on C50 if you want to go and visit them. Uh, we then move into the mid-entry mid machines, Brother and, and Cornet are in that, in that area and then the industrial high-end um, machines. Again, Cornet and Aoun, these are the two, the two big brands out there. Uh, even if your budget doesn't allow you to, to get in with these, it is good to go and see them and watch them work because it is something very, very, very impressive. Um, so we've also compared the price with the print speed. Generally, as the price increases, the machines do get faster. Um, but again, print speed can be misleading. Um, there's a lot of variables out there and a lot of the manufacturers were saying, well, how do you measure your print speed? Uh, subject to artwork, artwork size, the resolution, pre-treatment process. So again, we would, we would suggest don't base your decision on speed alone. Um, get some samples done, time it yourself, compare the different machines and, uh, and, and yeah, that's probably the best advice we can give you. Um, so moving on, we have our essential so guide. You should all have a copy of this. The essential guide, questions you should ask the distributor, the manufacturer, you should ask yourself um, factors you should consider. Looking uh, closely into the, 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 uh, the, the, the guide, you can see four little angry men. The, these are aimed at showing you where you will suffer possible complaints from your clients. Um, our way of dealing with complaints, our way of dealing with problems where one print is different to the next print is having a very fast refund reprint policy. It's going to happen. With screen printing, you have a spoilage rate. With direct to garment printing, you have a complaint rate. The only way to deal with this is, is to be good, be on the ball, and you know, re re reprint and return it to the client because it's, sometimes there is no reason behind what's gone wrong. Um, I'll give you a little story. We once printed 100 Gildan t shirts for a client. 70 of them came out perfect, 30 of them came out random. Not, not, not perfect, shall we say. And for the life of us, we just couldn't understand what had happened. We reprinted it over and over again and found no problems with the machine. Uh, they were the same product, the same garment, the same color. So what on earth could it have been? Somehow, we decided to go back to the manufacturer, to the distributor, who then went back to the manufacturer and actually told us that the T-shirts, although they were black, although they were all Gildan, they had come from different manufacturing plants. Therefore, they were manufactured in different places and the, uh, the makeup of the material, the humidity on the clothing was different. As a consequence, that was what went wrong. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a tricky, tricky scenario. So well, obviously it was something we never could have foreseen and, and it can and you know, will happen. 
So the first thing is price. How much does the machine cost? Who are your clients? Who are you aiming to sell to? And how many t-shirts are you aiming to print every day? Uh, that's, that's the most important question. I mean, machines start at 12, go up to, to 350,000 euros. So, you know, that's, that's the first thing you've got to ask. The second thing is print costs, right? Yeah, your print costs. Obviously, there's different inks out there on the market. They're all going to give you different, uh, different print costs. White ink usage, the software that's available with the machines. A lot of them, you can adjust the white ink, ink usage, which will then either bring down or put up your costs. And also, you need to consider the maintenance. Uh, these machines, when, when, when they need to be maintained, they'll do a print run. So you're going to get ink wastage and ink usage. We'll uh, just say, they, the, with regard to maintenance, um, Polyprint's new machine actually can be left to sit still for 30 days, and actually sometimes, so they're claiming even six months, but they're marketing that it can be left to sit still for, for 30 days without uh, being used. So, you know, there's an advance in, in, in direct gamma printing, and it just shows what's, what, how the future, you know, how it's sustainable and how, how the machines are, uh, you know, are better and better every day. Mm -hmm. And then moving on, the print speed. Um, obviously, all the machines are printing at different different speeds, depending on, uh, on what, what, which machine you're considering, and the print time. Um, I mean, if you're doing a one pass or, or a, a single pass or a double pass, that's obviously going to half the print time. Doing the white first and then the uh, the CMYK, and also the ink curing time that needs to come into consideration. Again, not wanted to mention Polyprint too many times, but they have brought out a. Uh, a new ink, the, their power inks, and they're claiming that's halving the curing time. It's obviously bringing down the speed of uh, the speed of the whole process, and obviously making it more profitable. Clearly, printing onto white clothing requires no underbase, no white layer, and it's it's press button ABC. It's fast, it's profitable, and it's cheap. Printing onto darks is much much more time intensive. Uh, you have to consider how much white ink to use. The more white ink you use, the more vibrant your final print, but therefore the more tactile the print you see so uh, you have to consider these things so touch and feel and smell S smell some of these machines inks do smell uh, and it, it can take two three four days if not longer for the smell to actually die down some customers are going to complain about this saying we can't sell this to our clients or we print them we put them into bags they go into a poly bag and then they get opened a week later and they have a very strong scent so you need to think about that you need to think that your customers are going to complain about the smell believe it or not touch and feel yeah, the touch of feel, going back to the smell, and uh, a lot of, a lot of, well, the ones that do smell, they will say, after, it'll come out after the first wash. So, but can you go to your client and you say to them, it'll be okay after the first wash? Uh, again, me personally, if I was receiving a t-shirt and it had a bit of a, bit of an, a whiff or an odor to it, um, they said, well, you have to wash it first. Well, I wouldn't be best pleased, to be perfectly honest. Um, so, touch and feel, we've touch covered and feel. that. So, I've just got three samples here. It's the same design. Uh, printed with different machines onto different t-shirts, but you can have a stretch, have a feel of these particular t-shirts and see the difference in the print. If you like to have a stretch and a feel and a smell and then uh, pass them around. Um, yes, they do stretch. Some of them you can pull apart, some of them return. It's the quality of the ink, right? Yep. And how much pre-treatment's gone down and, and the whole process. Um, printable fabric types. Again, we've got some more samples here. Um, this list is forever growing. Uh, Printers are developing new inks and new processes. Uh, we've got knitwear, cottons, polyesters, um, towels. Um, nowadays, there are it is it is growing in a huge variety out there. But again, do you need to be able to print on all this? Do your, are your is there a demand for this for your clients? Um, are, is your client going to ask for something specific? You need to make sure that that the machine that you've selected uh, can print on this on this uh, substrate. Because some machines do print knitwear, some don't. Some print trainers, some don't. So you, you need to know what's available and what they can and cannot do. Vibrancy and definition. On these samples here that this lady's looking at, you can see the difference in vibrancy, uh, the difference in definition. It's something you need to consider. Are you going to be printing photographers' artworks, you know, lovely high-resolution landscapes that require high resolution? Or are you going to be printing distressed band T-shirts? You know, you have to consider this, um, and again, you have to consider that you have to realise that one print will not look the same as another. So, the vibrancy and definition does does vary according to the amount of white ink you use, uh, the the pre-treatment, and also, what else is it? It's also the material itself and the t-shirts and the products. We do recommend you you find a a brand that works well, a product, a clothing brand that works well with direct garment printing and. 
Well, we're pleased to say that Pomodoro are a German um, brand and they've created their fabrics really do DTG well. So it's important that you use a good brand when selling. That, that extra pound um, will give more sustainability, more uh, a higher quality print and therefore a, a more satisfied customer. Washability. Yeah, the washability. Uh, definitely go out there, get some prints done, do some wash tests. Um, again, it's, if it isn't done correctly, then uh, you will have complaints for washability. It wouldn't be very good if a client gets it and then after a couple of washes, it's looking all faded and, and used. So get some tests on both white and dark garments. Do wash tests and uh, yeah, and try and avoid those complaints through that. Print size limitations? Yes. Back in 2005 um, until 2010, print size limitations was quite a, a challenge because the customers wanted as big as possible. Some machines could print up to 30 centimeters, some could print up to 40 centimeters. Nowadays, they've created lots of different platens that enable you to pay extra and buy different sized platens to enable you to print up to sort of 42 by 60 as a standard, I think. So it's not so much a problem now, but um, it's worth noting, again, Polyprint have just launched their long machine, which I think can now go up to 95 centimeters, almost a meter's worth of printing onto, onto clothing. So it's, it's expanding, but you need to consider this um, when, when, when buying a machine. And then finally, it's product patents. You, you're seeing knitwear. Um, we've told you that you can do trainers, um, which is really cool. And you can also even do... Well, on the next slide, we've got a bit of a list, but you can actually do food. So... DTF, direct to food printing. Believe it or not, you can actually direct to food. Yeah, quite um, big in the States. They're doing it quite a bit over there. I'd just like to say thank you to Polyprint and Amaya UK for the samples they've printed. Um, thank you very much to Amaya and to uh, Polyprint for the samples. Moving on. So, how is DTG being used? Who is using DTG? Who, you know, who are our clients? Who can be your potential clients? Retail and fashion brands are turning to mass personalization and mass customization. Um, these are tending to be using the likes of Cornet's machines, big established setups, and they're using it to adjust inventory, to have less stock, and to provide personalization experience and engagement to their, to their clients, to, you know, their, their customers. We did some work with a major high street brand, taking their children's wear and enabling the children to put their names on the front of a of a generic design, which worked really, really well. Um, the micro businesses and the online sellers, we've got lots of clients, individuals who have t-shirt designs and they're selling them on eBay, they're selling them on Amazon, funny t-shirts, pretty t-shirts, like landscape photographs, and they're selling anything from 25 a month to 100 a month. They make a, a, good, a good profit. And the good thing about this, the, these clients is, 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 is it's all on demand at the bottom. It's all on demand. They're not paying until they've received the order. And they're not actually paying for anything because there's no stock. They don't have to print 100 t-shirts and take one off the shelf every time. It's, hey, garment printing, we, we have an API that links to our website and their orders automatically come through to us. We print, we fulfill, we deliver. We sometimes put marketing material inside the packages. So these little businesses aren't actually having to do anything. Um, so that's, that's a, a big market. And these, these lots, of, lots of smalls make a big. Um, the thing that's given us our biggest growth in, 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 in this year and in DTG is the license industry. Um, and it's, again, this personalization world. The ability to take a Mr. Man character and put Johnny next to it. Uh, Johnny is 10 next to it. Happy birthday next to it. That is what licensing brands are now doing. Again, it's so they don't have to stock the product. And it's, it's big. It's, it's very big. And we're, we're about to launch three new brands, well, in about the next seven days. So it's exciting, exciting stuff there. And then obviously clothing printing companies are using it, people like us. Direct garment printing fits into the overall uh, garment decoration world very, very well. We don't want to compare it with screen printing or compare it with transfer printing because every, in our opinion, as garment printing experts, every uh, technique has a place and has a budget and has a specific need. So um, it fits very well. Obviously it fits well for full color onto darks and it provides options to do what screen printing can't do, and that's like 25 full color prints, for example. So that's who's using direct to garment printing. So I think uh, in conclusion, I think this is our last slide. In conclusion, what do we think? Well, a garment printing, we think it's time for you to uh, 
Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Seriously. Do it. Do it. Do it. We really do think that if you're thinking about direct to government printing, now's the time to get involved. This slide's available online. You can connect with us at any time. We're happy to answer some questions now and happy to have you know, a conversation with you over email at any time in the future. If you need our services, we're happy to provide them. Once again, thank you to FESPA. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gavin.